Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and I've visited uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, on uh, other occasions when I was a member of PECS um, and um, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to come back. Um, I, um, what I'm going to talk, talk today about is really some notable gaps in the study of institutions of environmental governance. And this uh, gap arises from the often absent gender perspective um, when you analyze environmental institutions. Now, it's a perspective that is uh, missing even in Eleanor Ostrom's work, who, as you know, of course, is, is a Nobel laureate, who did perhaps the most wide-ranging work on issues relating to governing the commons. Um, and to illustrate um, how this gap actually works, I'm going to talk about forest governance, although conceptually you could think about this in relation to other resources, it could think about water and, and various other resources. So the first question people ask, of course, uh, is why do we need a gender perspective in studying forest governance? And so here is why. Uh, I'll first talk about that and then talk about uh, some of my results. Now historically we know that rural communities the world over um, have uh, drawn hugely on forests. There's a very strong link between um, rural livelihoods and um, you know, the items that people draw on, on, especially on forests and commons for daily use and also for agriculture. There's actually a complementarity between um, forests and agriculture which we tend to forget. But what's important is that women and men in rural communities are differently situated vis-a-vis um, -vis forests and the commons. Rural women's dependence is different, it is much larger uh, than men's. And this distinctiveness stems not from some biological factors, it stems from, in particular, two aspects. Firstly, the gender division of labor. Uh, and the second is the gender division of economic resources. So the nature of women's dependence on forests and commons, what is it that they draw upon, what sort of eco-services do they get from forests and so on, is predicated on the specific responsibilities which are gendered. So for instance, it is primarily women and female children, uh, not 100%, but primarily who collect, say, firewood fodder, non-wood forest products um, from, um, from forests and commons, whereas men tend to depend on forests particularly for timber. And think of subsistence context. Can You'd be I ask a could, uh, this, uh, you're could, could, could you hold the questions until I made the presentation? Is that okay? Oh, I miss everything in that case. Uh, okay, please ask. Because you are talking about, is it in the whole world or in certain areas? Uh, I start with the globe and then I zoom in. On, uh, on South Asia, that's perfectly fine. Uh, so for instance, um, just to give you an example, 65% um, of rural households in India, 90% in Nepal, uh, and as much as 90% in Sub-Saharan Africa still depend on firewood as their primary fuel source. And if you take unprocessed biofuels, if you take firewood, um, crop waste and, and cattle uh, waste, then you find that these percentages increase even further. Now, in contrast to that, men in subsistence contexts depend on forests, as I said, uh, for uh, either for timber, for house building, for agricultural implements, um, and so on. Um, this is quite apart from drawing on forests for items that people might sell, but I'm particularly concentrating on subsistence use. What is also important to remember is that uh, women's dependence is everyday and men's dependence is sporadic. And this obviously comes um, the straightforwardly from the first point, uh, which is that if you, you, you're using forests for firewood and fodder, then you need to use it much more frequently than if you're using it occasionally to draw and um, you don't have to build or repair a house every day or build agricultural implements. In addition, um, the extent of dependence is much higher for women than men because women have less access to private property resources whether in rural areas, it's, whether it's land or it's access to employment. So their ability to actually purchase the items that they need for daily use is very much less uh, than, um, than for men. And class enters into this because if you are poor and landless, you have no private land, then you depend on the commons and forests even, even more. So both gender and class play out in your extent of dependence. <coughs> 
So in other words, um, gender inequalities in private property resources on which there is quite a lot of evidence uh, and social norms create um, these critical differences in dependence on communal resources uh, across most classes but in varying degree. And therefore one can surmise from that that the stake that they will have um, on forest conservation in the rules they might make for extraction um, and the knowledge they might have of ecosystems could differ. So I'll just give you, share some pictures, uh, some of you may be familiar with some pictures like this from regions that you may have visited in. And as you can see, uh, if you're depending on firewood every day, then it starts from a fairly young age, you, you may be little girls, to uh, into old age. Uh, similarly, you have pictures of fodder. Now, these are from different regions of the world. Um, some pictures are from South Asia, others from um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, for instance, the collecting mushrooms is um, a woman collecting. So, there you can collect food items as well. Now, what, is, what does this actually mean? What it means is that the nature of dependence and the extent of dependence um, means uh, that uh, you um, are much more adversely affected if forests, for instance, decline or they degrade or they are enclosed in some way. So, so for instance, uh, there are unequal adverse effects um, on women's time. Uh, this is easy that if a forest get cut down near the villages, you have to travel longer distances. If you're drawing on forests, suppose you're selling firewood or you're selling no seasonal non-wood forest products, then your incomes will be affected. Your incomes will also be affected if you're working on agriculture, but you're spending so much time collecting firewood that the time you have for crop cultivation may decline. Um, nutrition and health get affected because we tend to forget living in cities that in fact, uh, quite a lot of um, wild f uh, fruits, vegetables, herbs, and a whole range of products are actually extracted and continue to be extracted um, for uh, uh, daily use. And health gets uh, affected uh, through the nutritional effect. In addition, we get, because of the differences, different products that men and women draw from forests, you have different knowledge of ecosystems. So for instance, um, some of the more detailed anthropological work suggests uh, that women tend to know much more about the grasses and the firewood varieties and the non-wood forest products, um, both the range of products as well as how to extract uh, them sustainably, sustainably without uh, damaging uh, the environment. Men tend to know much more about distant species and much more about timber species. So there are differences in no knowledge of ecosystems. There are also differences in gestation periods because um, firewood can be a flow. I mean, you, you have um, uh, dead branches and, and twigs and so on falling to the ground and you can pick them up. So there's a sort of flow concept. Fodder is seasonal. Um, timber, on the other hand, has a much longer gestation period. So this affects also the pressures you have to extract, gender differences in pressures to extract, and the impact of extraction. Um, and from this, one can surmise um, that the values you might place might differ in different elements of ecosystems in forests. Women will place a value on certain kinds of products in a forest, and men will place another kind. Um, you know, whether you go for plantations or biodiversity uh, can also differ because if you're drawing a whole range of biodiverse products, you're going to value that much more uh, than if you just want timber and you can have a plantation and cut it down. Uh, and this creates therefore differences in interests and preferences um, which have implications for institutional functioning and sustainability. Um, you don't have to go by the big words, I will also elaborate and talk about it. <laughs> um, so basically, we need to question standard assumptions about the commonality of gender interests um, and preferences um, in forest conservation. Now these are assumptions which are by no means uh, restricted to um, ecological economics. They are actually standard social science assumptions about how households function and interests within and outside the household. So all the movement away from unitary household models to bargaining approaches to, the, to, to households in economic theory would impinge on the way we look at this issue. I do want to point out, and this is, comes back to your question, um, that historically, 
of course, um, in Europe and UK and in many parts of the world, uh, this was this picture that you see today for Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and so on, um, was, um, was not dissimilar. So you had quite a lot of dependence. Um, if, you, if you look at 18th, 19th century Britain, um, prior to the enclosure movement, then you find that they drew hugely and there was a gender division there. Women drew hugely on local forests. Um, and uh, Jane Humphreys, who's an economic historian, has written very eloquently about it. So here's a picture from, um, from the UK, 19th century England. And as you can read there, but also I'll just say that she talks in length. Women are the principal gatherers of fuel in Cornwall. They cut fras in early summer from thickets up to 10 feet high. And in Surrey, they brought home prodigious loads of wood from the forest, bent nearly double. She, then she also describes women gathering watercress, rabbits, pigeons, raspberries, and so on and so forth. So this is, you can superimpose this picture to the earlier pictures that I had shown you, and you can see that it's not dissimilar. But that was historic. Now, the enclosure movement in, in Britain, of course, converted what was common wealth into private wealth. And therefore, it deprived peasant women of independent access to items of lady, uh, daily use. Women, in fact, protested the enclosures for this reason. But they had very little voice in actually, actually making the decisions. And that brings me to the heart of what I have to say. Because this duality, that is, women's central stake and knowledge of forests and their typical absence from bodies that govern forests was common until recently, whether you looked at the Amazon or you looked at Africa and especially if you looked at South Asia. Now, there has been change, but it's been limited. So in recent decades, um, following um, a result, and I'll jump you know, a lot in history here to come to the contemporary period, uh, that as you moved towards centralized control of forests to decentralized control of forest management, um, you found that there were some shifts. Now, in the 1980s, what you find, if you look at the debate on forest management, there was a big debate called the property rights debate in which it was very clear because satellite images indicated that deforestation was proceeding very rapidly globally. And the debate was, and in many areas, in large parts of the world, you find that the government actually does the management of forests, although there are some differences. I mean, I know Sweden has some proportion of private forests and so on. But um, what you found was, what these pictures revealed was state failure in protecting and conserving forests. So the debate was, well, who should be managing the forests if you want to conserve them? The governments have failed, which is very clear, that you have forest land but no forests, you have no forest canopy. Um, and many people, economists in particular, people of my ilk, <laughs> uh, argued that uh, you should, uh, why don't we privatize? But of course that is not an option, you know, forests are public goods, they are very large um, in, in space and many people have a stake in it. Economic theory suggested that communities could not manage forests. Why? Uh, because people will free ride and nobody would cooperate. However, what was very interesting was that on the ground, you had numerous examples of communities actually protecting forests. You had forest movements in the Amazon, you had forest movements in South Asia, and you had many other small examples of communities protecting and conserving forests. So what you find is much before economic theory moved in the direction of accepting the sort of things that Ostrom finally measured, you know, uh, in, in terms of the examples of cooperation, long before that, you begin to see that on the ground, government policy begins to shift. And in the early 1990s, you find that at least 50 countries had decided that they will pass over some part of their forest land to local communities to protect and manage. So. Um, so this, this was a big institutional shift from the idea of centralized control to the idea of looking at communities not as predators but as protectors. 
And this also uh, overcome, overcame the skepticism, you know, the classic we all know, uh, Olson's theory of collective action, you know, Hardin's, um, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the stylization of that. Some of you who are economists would know the Prisoner's Dilemma games. There were 2,000 Prisoner's Dilemma articles on Prisoner's Dilemma in the, in, 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 in the 80s, basically arguing that people could not cooperate. So this was a big shift. India and Nepal, and this is where I'm going to focus particularly, in both these countries, 96% of forests are, are government-owned. And India was one of the first uh, among these 50 countries to shift to decentralized forest management in the June of 1990. Nepal, and what it meant was they called it the Joint Forest Management Program, where um, you gave over degraded forest land to, to village communities to protect and manage, and um, you could share uh, there were different memorandums on sharing of costs and benefits. So that was the incentive that you could make the rules and you could extract. It was not monetary incentives, there were incentives of, for local use. And um, Nepal uh, did uh, s something similar in 1993 in its own version of community forestry. So by the early 2000s, India had an estimated 84,000 community forestry groups involving 8.4 million rural families and protecting 22% of India's forest area, which is quite substantial. In Nepal, you had at that point nearly 10,000 community forestry groups covering 1 million households and 11% of, of their forest land. There was a difference. Uh, Nepal gave over less even somewhat less degraded forest to village communities. Um, in the Indian context, it was mainly degraded forest. So these groups that began to, uh, to protect, I'm going to call them Community Forestry Institutions, CFI for short, in, in short. Now women were to be included in CFIs, but in limited extent. And their effective participation, of course, was restricted because of conservative social norms. So you'll ask me, well, what does inclusion mean? Um, basically, what a CFI is, it has a fairly simple and two-tier management structure. You have a general body uh, which would cover the entire village. So all village households, for instance, could be members of the general body and have a say in a common resource. And then you have an executive committee of 9 to 15 members, not unlike the sorts of structures you have in universities or in many other institutions. Now both bodies interactively created the rules of forest use, the punishments for abuse, that is breaking the rules, forms of protection, benefit distribution and conflict resolution. But the core decision-making body was of course the EC, the executive committee. So who had voice in the EC can make a huge difference to the kinds of rules you make and who benefits and loses from the protection. Typically, women were not even nominal members. So here's a typology. I mean, you can actually use this. Um, I uh, had, this is part of an article I'd written. Uh, this was uh, in, uh, in World Development. It had, it had been published, uh, in, I think, in 2001. Uh, but it's, it's a kind of typology you could use in many institutions. But if you apply it to the context we're talking about today, then you found, find that women were not even nominal members in many cases. And the reason was partly that the criteria for making members were supposedly gender neutral, but not effectively. So supposedly gender neutral means one person per household will be a member, but that tended to be the male head of household. Um, but what you want is moving beyond nominal participation, beyond passive and consultative participation to actually being able to influence the decisions. We all know about consultative participation. You know, people come and consult you. Well, what is your opinion? What do you think? Politicians come and consult you. But you never really move beyond that to actually say, OK, what we've said has actually made a difference. Too. So this is where we want to really move. We want to move from nominal participation to empowered participation. But that is a long journey. And in most cases, in these CFIs, you found what was really um, uh, what I call participatory exclusions. However, and this is where the story gets more interesting, is that you did have cases where you have not just two women. There was a sort of mandatory, let's have at least two women in the committees. Um, in many cases, you do find on the ground there were some 30 to 40% women 
I looked at, well, how is this? And there were non-systematic factors. There were factors which had to do with the history of cooperation. Some factors were ecological, some were demographic, some, were, some had to do with the leadership, local leadership. Now, having more women in the EC makes a big difference to their effective participation. So, for instance, in my, um, and I'll be talking much more now uh, in relation to my own work on India and Nepal, when I actually try to measure what percent makes a difference? Is there a critical mass effect? Then I found that 25 to 33 percent is, the, is where the critical mass lies. If you have that proportion of women in the committees, mixed committees, then it makes a big difference to their ability to attend, to speak up, and uh, to, um, uh, to uh, actually take up leadership positions and influence decisions. Uh, I, won't, uh, the, I won't talk in detail about how I arrived at these 25. It's, it's a complicated exercise of actually looking at records of meetings, who attends them, etc., how frequently, and so on. But the key question that we want to answer today is would women's greater participation in CFI decision making affect governance outcomes? Now, typically, what you find, and let me just show you a picture of these participatory exclusions. Can you spot the women? There are two women there. <laughs> um, I think there's a... So, if you look at the red. <laughs> this is what they say. <laughs> now, <laughs> what you find is that um, how do we, we move away from exclusions to inclusions. Now typically if you look at the governance, environmental governance literature, you find that economists typically who study environmental collect collective action um, in, in green governance have paid rather little attention to gender. Whereas people in other disciplines, you find, um, have looked at much more at women's absence and tried to measure why there, there is the absence. What I did was I turned this question on its head because neither body of work actually enables you to answer the question, what if women were present? Would their inclusion, which we know is undeniably important for equity, also affect decisions of forest use, the outcomes for conservation, outcomes for subsistence, how many women matter, would women's class matter, and so on. Now answers to these questions could actually prove foundational for effective environmental governance and policy. But there was very little empirical focus on this. So I made it the central focus of my book, Gender and Green Governance. There's a copy here um, just for, on display. Um, now in the book, I empirically measure a whole range of things. Um, I measure whether uh, inclusion of women in the executive committee, which as you remember, I said was the most important core part of the governance structure, uh, whether it makes a difference to effective participation, to the rules of forest use, to rule violations, uh, forest conservation, and firewood and fodder shortages. Today, I'm going to focus on forest conservation part of my results. Now, we already, we've already noted uh, why we would expect women's presence to make a difference, right? Why would we expect to have an impact? And namely, that women's dependence on forests, the extent of dependence, the nature of their dependence, the everyday nature of their dependence, um, all this and the difference in gestation period, all this makes a difference to the stakes that men and women have in forest conservation and the pressure to extract and the impact of extraction. It also makes a difference to knowledge of ecosystems. So all this could make a difference. I'm not arguing, I want to emphasize, that only women have this knowledge or women, only women have a stake. Both men and women have a stake, but the nature of the stake that they have is not the same. But having said that, just as we can't assume um, that men and women have the same preferences, we also cannot assume without verifying that including women will lead to all good things. Now, there are a lot of linear narratives on gender and environment which tend to argue that, that we're only worried about women not being there. Once they are there, uh, a lot of good things will follow. I think, and I emphasize this, we cannot automatically assume that. Why not? Because rural women's dependence on forests is complex. On the one hand, they have a stake, 
in forest regeneration because they are dependent on the resource. But on the other hand, precisely because of the, um, the everyday nature and the substantial part of their dependence also means that they want to extract fast. So if you ask a poor woman, uh, you know, in, in rural India, from anywhere you would ask, and here's one example, and she's landless, here's one answer that I got. Of course it hurts me to cut a green branch, but what would I do if my children are hungry? In other words, women face conflicting choices between immediate subsistence and long-term conservation. So the impact of their presence on conservation could actually go either way. And I think this is not, this, this, this idea about what we need today and what we keep for the future, of course, is the major question in, in, in relation to when we think about the environment. What are we willing to sacrifice today for future generations? This is a question which is as important globally. It's particularly important locally. But in trying to understand this, what difference will it make um, to include women, we also have to control for a range of other factors so that we don't attribute to gender what is not its due. So what I did was, I, my data relates to 135 uh, CFIs, of which 65 were drawn from um, uh, Western India, uh, and uh, 70 were drawn from Nepal. Um, which you can see on the map. The earlier part of my uh, argument, of course, relates to all of India and Nepal, and I had traveled extensively, but the more specific and more detailed econometric work uh, was based on these two regions. Gujarat, by the way, although it's only a small part of India, is larger in population and geographic size than Nepal. So um, the way I, I sampled this was I looked at a stratified um, a random sample. In the case of Gujarat, I did a two-way stratification. I looked at, I chose groups uh, which had um, uh, two women or less than they, in the executive committee versus those which, who had more because that was what the guidelines had wanted. So you want to see whether that becomes a marker. And in the case of Nepal, you also have a, a number of all women groups. So I have a three-way stratification. You have mixed groups with two women or less, mixed groups with more than two women, and then you have all women's groups. Now field work, by the way, was quite difficult because in Nepal you had at that time the Maoist insurgency um, and it was at its height, so it was quite dangerous often for, for, the, for the researchers to go into the field. Nevertheless, we interviewed villagers, we interviewed men and women, women's groups separately, we interviewed executive committees, um, uh, forest officials, key informants, there were sort of nine types of questionnaires. We also recorded histories, environmental histories, why do people protect, and I also managed to get some satellite data for, uh, nine, from nine, from, for over that period, 1991 to 2001, in the Gujarat context, which was calibrated to the villages that I was studying. Now, forest profiles, um, of course, uh, were different. Uh, forests that were handed over to um, villagers in, in, in the context of Gujarat in India uh, were very, very, very degraded. In fact, if you look at the ethnography of that period, you find people saying that if you took a broom and tried to get a few leaves off the hillside, you wouldn't be able to get it. It was that degraded. On the other hand, in the case of Nepal, it's in the middle hills, so you have much more biodiverse forests. Also, what is interesting in Nepal, if you look at this table, um, is that the all women groups, if you compare them with mixed groups, mixed gender groups, you find that they got half, on average, half the forest area, much more degraded, twice as degraded, less canopy cover, and much younger forests. So in fact, they started out with a substantial initial disadvantage. Well, why is this the case? So I explored that, and what you find is that forest officials said, well, women have no experience in protecting forests or conserving forests, so we can't actually hand, the, hand them over a large chunk of the forest. We must first test them out. Um, the women, of course, assured them that they would be able to do well. We'll have to see whether they did or not once you come to my results. So what does forest protection involve? You can protect forests in a variety of ways. You can protect them by keeping a guard, everybody in the village pays a small amount and you have a guard from within the village because the person has to be accountable. Or you can have a patrol group, say three of us go and do a patrol for one week every day, then three others in, in the village and three others, so you have a rotating patrol group. 
You can have an informal lookout, people work in the fields, and they know if some strangers are coming in to cut or to break the rules. Or you can have a mix of these. And that's what you have. You actually have a mix. Um, but it does make a difference uh, whether you have a guard or not. Now, um, this protection, um, the argument is, does it improve forest canopy and biodiversity? And are, is improvement more likely if you have a larger proportion of women? Now, in order to control for the gender factor, you have to look at a range of other factors. Because I'm sure you will say, well, how do we know it's because there are a larger proportion of women? And you're quite right. So you have executive, uh, executive committee characteristics. Gender is one of them. You would expect the gender composition, the hypothesis would be, to make a difference because um, you have, um, you, you, if you involve 50% more of the population in the protection effort, or at least represent it, you would expect the outcome to be more positive than if you left them out. Secondly, the knowledge systems are different. As I said, uh, the knowledge of ecosystems is different. And so you would expect the gender composition to make a difference. You might expect age of the women also to make a difference because older women have more authority, they have, and they may have more institutional and other knowledge of systems. Um, other factors, uh, the protection method could matter. So I controlled for uh, the protection method, the characteristics of the forest. Is a large forest more difficult to protect or a small forest? The size of the forest. Um, how far it is from the village, what, what is its initial quality, we talk about resilience, is it so degraded that it's impossible to improve or not, and so on. And then locational characteristics, you know, how many settlements, what is the composition of the population, if you're landless, if you're migrant, you have, your, you, you, you might argue that if there are a lot of landless in the village, then they're more likely to break the rules simply because they need the forest much more and they don't have their own land and so on. So there are a whole range of factors um, that I control for. However, what anybody working on conservation and forest conservation knows that how do we measure it? How do we measure change and outcomes? It's extremely difficult. So we have a range of measures and it's very important. Um, I mean firstly uh, looked at canopy cover which is the standard way in which and regeneration due to protection and then you can have a range of assessments. Where do you get the data from? If you're not actually doing experiments on the ground, you know, physical experiments. Um, your research team, so we had uh, uh, the research team visited every forest and came up with an, in, uh, we came up with an, um, a, a, a measure. The villagers would know, um, the forest department, and then satellite sources. So because of the complexity of how you measure it, all these, all these um, indicators were used. And uh, we ended up with four indicators, four in the case of Gujarat and two in the case of Nepal. I'll be happy to answer questions for those of you who want more information. Now, overall, what you find, which is very interesting, is that almost all the cases I studied reported that forests had improved in a variety of ways. And you see this in the macro data. So between 1991 and 2001 in India, forest area which was declining hugely prior to that, in that 10 years, you have an improvement of 3.6 million hectares, which is a su very substantial gain. And in the case of, the, of Gujarat that I studied, it is disproportionately higher than the national in terms of improvement. So clearly something is, has happened. This is just a picture that one of the NGOs had when they started. This is a village, before and after. Yes, I must confess, it's slightly different seasons. Nevertheless, um, this, without the protection, you wouldn't have arrived at this. And it's, it's that inset, um, this part. It's really this part that you see uh, here. Uh, it's essentially, this is an area which is semi-arid. It, if, you, if the rootstock is intact, it's primarily a teak area, then within five or six years, you can get a young teak um, forest. It's not very biodiverse, but nevertheless, you get a good canopy cover. However, is this better if there are more women on the committees? And here are my regression results. I found, in fact, that it was the case that gender matters in important ways. So if you look at the all district analysis for Gujarat and you compare um, 
groups with two women and less and those with more than two women, after controlling for all the other factors that we've listed, we find that it significantly, um, it shows significantly higher um, probability of improvement uh, in forest canopy and regeneration uh, than if you had virtually no women on the executive committees. In the case of Nepal, the results are even more striking and I'll share with you only one part of the results. If you want more details, um, do, do visit, uh, have a look at, my, at the book. Um, but here's what we found in the case of Nepal, which is, um, I've just highlighted this for you to help you out, <laughs> that you actually find that there's a 51% greater, this is marginal effects, greater probability if you compare all women's groups with mixed gender groups, there's a 51% greater probability of an improvement in forest canopy after controlling for other factors. So this is, this is a, a, it was much more dramatic than I had actually expected. Um, there are other factors which matter, um, you know, the, the, uh, you can see from the yellow, the age matters, older, if you have older members in the committee, it matters, if you're literate, it matters, and it matters and I'll come back to this result, what kind of forest is handed over? Now, if, if, if initially your forest is, is, is better, it's less degraded, the chances of improvement are greater. So it's all the more interesting that despite the fact that women were given younger, less biodiverse, and much more degraded forests, they come up with this very strong result. In addition, I'll share with you um, one uh, result for Gujarat. Now, in, in the case of Gujarat, India, uh, there were three districts, and in this case, there were two districts, three districts, uh, and one of those districts had some special features. The special features were that it was not, if you look at the groups which had a larger proportion of women in the executive committee, and looked at those which had a substantial number of landless women, it led to the committee extracting more from the forest. Now what would you expect? You would expect that if you extract a lot from the forest, your instinctive reaction will be, if you're extracting more, that forest must be doing rather badly. So if you have a lot of landless women, they will pressurize the, the group to extract more and conservation will suffer. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So here's what you get for Panch Mahal. In fact, every single indicator, it's a small sample, but nevertheless, you get quite robust results. And you find that in, in this, groups with two women and more, or more than two women, compared to groups with two women and less, they have significantly less degraded area over time. You have 75% higher probability of improvement in forest canopy, and you have 57% greater probability in terms of improvement in forest condition. Now what this suggests is, in fact, that there are benefits, not just of including more women in the executive committee, but including the poorest women. Now this is not what you would expect it. And also uh, that extracting more doesn't do the forest any harm. Now why is there a case, why is this the case? That there is no conflict between equity and efficiency, as economists tend to put it. Now, why is this, uh, this the case? And this is the case because of two factors. One is that if you extract some, if you extract nothing versus if you extract something in the forest, it removes the dry matter, you know, dry wood and so on. And we know, I mean, ecologists know that you have to remove the dry wood in order that it has less likelihood of forest fires. And forest fires are quite common, you know, on small scale, not on the scale that happens in the United States, but, you know, you have forest fires. Uh, the second is it, it is ecologically better, it's, so it's ecologically better if you extract from the floor of the forest and so on, which women tend to do, firewood and so on. And it's, uh, it's better socially because you have less resentment. You know, a lot of forest fires in the colonial period and otherwise were set by local people because they resented the fact of closure. So both socially and ecologically, you have, um, uh, you, you have a benefit from extracting rather than not extracting at all. This extraction, of course, I must emphasize, is within limits. It's within boundaries. It's not open extraction. Nevertheless, it is more extraction than would take place if there weren't those landless women on the committee. And so overall, um, therefore, 
um, the groups which have a larger proportion of women matter. Now this is what the women themselves um, say. This is just some of the qualitative, I've just shown you some of the quantitative um, analysis and some of the qualitative, why is it? And here the women themselves say that um, they will comply with the rules much more if they are on the executive committee because they feel a sense of ownership. We think the forest is ours. When I was only a CFI member, I would steal grass from the forest. But after taking responsibility, I have stopped stealing and I feel the forest should be protected. They also spread uh, information on rules much more. So they persuade others to follow. Now, you know, when we think of South Asia, you must remember there is also a gender division of space and there are social norms. So if you have a male petrol group, they can't physically catch hold of, of women who might be coming from the other village because um, it's, it's socially not acceptable. Um, it's probably not socially acceptable anywhere, uh, but uh, particularly uh, in, in South Asia. So you have a situation where women are much more in the, in the position to communicate with other women to persuade them uh, not to break the rules. And in many cases, I've, uh, in, in the qualitative evidence, uh, because I've used mixed methods, um, you find that often it's women who uh, stop the forest fires. The second thing is, and it's, this is not captured always in the regression exercises, is the knowledge that women bring to bear in the protection effort. So when you talk to them, they will tell you, they know exactly how to extract, for instance, tree fodder. In Nepal, women actually climb the tree and pluck. Which point in time they must be plucked so that it doesn't have a negative effect, it actually is able to regenerate easily. So there are many, many aspects of local knowledge systems which they bring to bear <coughs> if they are uh, in responsible positions. And then you also find that older women make a difference. <laughs> but before that, here's a little petrol group. This is a women's petrol group. The men have a petrol group. The women decided they would also want to have, they want an informal petrol group. So this is one of the petrol groups. And um, this is what this group told me. So, Additional factors also matter. Um, if, the, if, the, if there's a women's association, it makes a difference. If you have older women, it makes a difference. They're less socially restricted in terms of speaking up than if you're young and you're just a daughter-in-law. And then there is conflict resolution. Now, I didn't directly measure conflict resolution. Is it better if there are more women? But there is a growing literature in experimental games in the West, which tends to suggest that cooperation is better when the larger proportion of women in mixed groups. And some of this literature um, is published in the journal Negotiation, which is brought out at the, by the Kennedy School at Harvard in Women in Public Policy. So let me, let me uh, then have some, give you some policy pointers. Firstly, um, women's greater presence in forest governance, this we know from the results, can significantly improve conservation and regeneration. Conservation also is, um, is enhanced if you have more landless and poor women on the executive committee. What is interesting is that being poor and landless doesn't really prevent you from speaking up in these groups. Now there is a whole literature, especially in the gender literature, which tends to, and among feminist philosophers, which tends to argue that if you are really disadvantaged, you're not going to be able to participate. In fact, you find the opposite. And that is because they have rather little to lose in terms of social status by speaking up, and they have much to gain if the, if the uh, decisions go in their favor. So, so you, you have this. And we need, therefore, creative, creative mechanisms for increasing women's numbers. If I have persuaded you, uh, and uh, I'm quite happy to have skeptical questions. Uh, but if I persuaded you, then you will ask me, well, you only talked about two regions, and how do we scale this up? How do we increase this influence? And what I suggest is what I call a web of strategic alliances. You know, webs are pretty strong things, although they are really gossamer if you think of a spider's web. It's so fine, and yet it's, it can be quite strong. Um, so here's a stylized version of what you could do. Scaling up doesn't mean you have thousands and thousands of people in a committee. 
if you go back to Ostrom's idea of polycentric and you go back to nested, then, then federations so could be an answer. So you have community forestry groups or community forestry institutions. In South Asia, but in many parts of the developing world, you also have women's groups which are not doing any forest protection, but are involved in other things in rural areas. So self-help groups, there are several million self-help groups in India. What do they do? They form, they start with credit, they, they, they take over, they take charge of other things. If you were to link the self-help groups with the community forestry groups, you would increase their numbers because they're all in the same village. Increase their numbers in the community forestry groups. And if you federate them, you have horizontal and your vertical alliances, then you have a scaling up. And here is a less stylized version of scaling up. Here's a federation. FECO Fund, it's a community forestry group in Nepal. <coughs> How large do you think it is? It's countrywide. 14,000 groups are linked to it. They have representation. So the groups send their representative at the next year, and then they send their representative to the next year. And in the constitution, it's written that 50% of the, of the representatives will be women. So this has made a difference. Um, if you look at, uh, look at the discussion in my book and in the general literature, you'll find it has made a big difference to their voice with governments. For instance, um, when the, there, were, there was an attempt to change the community forestry rules, it had a say, it had a say in the democracy movement. So you have a way by which you can scale up through a federated structure, through these um, alliances. Are there additional pointers? Uh, we are interested in a number of other things, you'll say. We are interested in designing enduring institutions for governing the commons, right? And if you remember, uh, Ostrom had a set of principles that she'd put forward. If you begin to gender those principles, you can argue that if you're not going to include women, then clearly those principles are not being followed, in fact. Typically what you find in the empirical literature is there is no attempt to actually even see that. People say, okay, are households participating are, are out of those X number of principles, how many are being followed and therefore this is a robust institution. But um, if you look at the underside of it, you might actually discover that if it has rather few women in it and landless women in it, poor women in it, it's not as robust as it might appear on the surface. So designing enduring institutions. Assessing, if you want to assess the cost of forest decline, it's again very important if you want to frame gender just policies that you take this into account. And we talk about carbon credits today, but again we don't talk about it. We talk about communities, maybe we talk about households. But the carbon credits question, and distributional question, needs to penetrate to within the household. And so on, I mean you can, you can be quite creative with this. But long term, do we want people to be so dependent on forests for the everyday needs, firewood, fodder? Despite the dependence, we don't have enough forests to be able to use in terms of an expanding population and the demands on them. So the long term policy must be different, shouldn't it? It must be different in terms of being able to replace what you draw from forests with other uses. Now to some extent it's happening in countries, you know. For instance, um, you know, when I, was a, when I was a very small kid, you could still get teak if you're building a house for a doors and furniture. It's no longer possible. I mean, it's very, very expensive and it's not even allowed that you cut a lot of teak. So you, you're moving away from um, finding alternatives to some of the ways in which you drop on forests. But we've made hardly a dent on the question of fuel, firewood. I'll give you some example. Um, so national policies need to say, change. And here is a picture. Now indoor air pollution, what does it do, continuing to use firewood, apart from the fact that it can have an impact on, 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 on forests and, and, and the shortages that you face. It's not only the shortages of firewood that we are facing in rural households, but you're, they are highly polluting, smokes, 
And you will be astonished. I mean, there's a huge literature now on this. And, um, that, and one of the Millennium Development Goals um, was also pointed this out. In, in the context of India, women face the, their risk of mortality is 50% higher than men's from um, re uh, various forms of respiratory infections. Some 200 to 300,000 infants die every year from just being on their mother's laps in a smoky kitchen when she's cooking. Um, there are also greenhouse effects. So what are the solutions? Well, people talk a lot about improved stores. We've been talking about improved stores for at least three decades. Um, and um, that, that is a that is a unimproved stove. The black kitchen isn't because the photograph is not very clear. It's because the walls are full of soot. This one is an improved stove, which has um, you know it it has a chimney to take off the smoke and so on. It is also more fuel efficient. But is this the answer? It's still not a clean fuel. So there are other answers that we need to think about. In the short term, at least. Biogas plants. Do people know what a biogas plant is? You do know what a biogas plant? Will you tell us what a biogas plant is? Yeah, you, you use the um, bioproducts and then you make biogas. Well, you, that's right. You, you bring in the bioproducts. It can be your kitchen waste. It can be other things. You put it in a sealed um, uh, container. You can build it from local material or other material and particularly methane. Uh, comes out and then you have slurry so you actually use all the components of it you can get very rich manure from it and this is something which is very possible if you have one or two head of cattle and you can use your own waste this is one of the things I did uh, we, we now in our, my institute in, in Delhi when I was director we installed a biogas plant which covers 60 to 70 percent of the um, fuel needs of the hostel kitchen so it is possible um, but to influence these policies, we need to go um, beyond the village. We need to influence policies at the national level. National energy policies must change. And their federations of the kind I talked about can make a big difference. To carry the voice of the rural poor, and especially women, and their needs to the top level for changing energy policy. Now China has, uh, uh, and India have both have had programs uh, on uh, improved stoves and biogas. Bio China has been particularly successful in being able to promote it. Thank you.